Thank you, Matt. Uh, as Matt said, my name is Brett. Uh, I currently work at Microsoft in the Azure Dice Data Science Tools team. Uh, the one cloud provider out of the top three who actually has Canadian data centers. So go us. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about what's new in Python 3.6. Uh, if you want to tune me out, there is a document version of basically what I'm talking about at docs.python.org slash 3.6 slash what's new slash 3.6. Well, you can read the URL. But basically, if you go to docs.python.org, look at the 3.6 docs, there's a link to what's new. And I'll be basically be talking about the highlights of that document. So I completely understand if you just want to get out your laptop, read, and just listen to the dulcet tones of my voice as I just talk about other things. Um, but basically, Python 3.6 is shaped up to be quite the release. There are actually 16 Python enhancement proposals in this release. Uh, if you don't know what a PEP is, it's basically a document that people have to write to propose a, a fundamental change to the language. Typically, it's around syntax or some really key APIs. Uh, but it's basically a big deal if a PEP lands in a release. And there's 16 of them. There's not been this many number of PEPs in a single release since Python 3.0, which should give you an idea of how big this is. Actually, I went back and counted from when PEP started in Python 2.0 to now, and literally Python 3.0 is the only one that, even that beats this. So this is a lot of stuff. Uh, I also want to quickly thank, though, um, the Python core sprint that was held uh, the first full week of September uh, was hosted by Instagram, uh, organized by Wukash Lenga of Instagram, and sponsored by Instagram, Microsoft, and Python Software Foundation. 12 of the 16 peps you're going to see here were worked on during that week by some people in this room. And so I just want to quickly uh, give a shout out to all the people who helped make that sprint happen, because they got a lot of stuff in to making 3.6 a really great release. So without further ado, let's start going into all these peps. Uh, these are all in numeric order. And by the way, if you do go to uh, python.org slash dev slash peps, that's another way you can tune me out. And you can actually read the peps as I go through them. So <laughs> you have multiple ways to ignore me, but still get the information. Uh, but you can basically go there and look at the pep numbers and pull up the pep if you want to read more details later on. So the first pep we're going to talk about here is pep468, which is preserving keyword argument order. Uh, if you've ever used star star uh, kwargs, you may have noticed that it's just a dictionary, right? And if you specify keyword arguments, they come back in a random order because dictionaries aren't ordered. Well, some people thought it might actually be handy if we can actually preserve the order of the keyword arguments to a function. So in Python 3.6, we are basically making the promise that we will return a mapping, a mapping uh, for star star kw args that will actually keep the order of the arguments passed into the function call. So as you can see here, calling with a, b, and c as keyword arguments will return a mapping whose iterables on keys and values and what have you will actually keep that order of a, b, and c. Uh, I'm going to make one little point here. Uh, this is one of the only two key parts in the language where we're making order guarantees for the mapping that's being returned somewhere. Don't rely on dictionaries magically being ordered for you anywhere else. Uh, there's no other guarantees anywhere. So if it happens to be ordered, consider it circumstance and just purely luck. Uh, we might change that in the future, but as of right now, we're not ready to commit to that yet. So only where I mention orders being preserved, consider that order being preserved for a mapping object. Uh, the next pep in our list here is pep 487, uh, simpler customization of class creation. Uh, who here has tried to write a meta class? Who here found it really simple? <laughs> OK, I know these jokers aren't telling the truth. So basically, no one finds it simple. It's really complicated. Uh, there's a lot of little subtleties to it. I, don't, I can never remember the arguments to uh, Dunder New for meta class, for instance. There's a lot of work to getting it to work. But there are cases where being able to work on the creation of a class is really helpful. Now, we also have class decorators, which are great, but that's post-creation, and you don't necessarily get all the information uh, while the class is being built for you at that point. So what happened is in Python 3.6, we've added this new dunder method, dunder init under subclass, uh, that will actually be past the class and any keyword arguments that get passed into the class statement. So as you'll notice here um, in the class hello world example at the bottom, I'm subclassing this pep 487 uh, base class that defined dunder init. 
to automatically add a hello uh, func uh, method. And I passed in a whom argument of world. And if you notice, this actually gets passed in as a keyword argument into the actual creation. So we now have kind of covered the, str um, the straddling between uh, class decorators and meta classes to make sure that you can insert your code as necessary during class creation to get the results you need based on the amount of detail you really have to be involved with during the creation of classes. Uh, PEP 495, local time disambiguation. If you've ever worked with date times, you might find this kind of interesting and useful. Uh, if you've never have, you're a very lucky individual. Uh, date times are a real pain in the rear. Um, so let's all think back a week to daylight savings. 1.30 in the morning, your clock says. So has it been an hour and a half since midnight or two and a half hours since midnight? Yeah, you don't know, right? Because you don't know if it's your first time passing between 1 and 2 a.m. or if it's the second time after the leap back to go back through 1 and 2 a.m. Unless you specified your time zone, which you should always do if you can. I've learned that the hard way many a times. Always specify your time zones. Uh, but if you can't, there's this concept now of a fold, which basically specifies whether or not the time you're passing through that repeat period during daylight saving of falling back happens on the first go around or the second go around. So if you look here, you'll notice that when the fold is nothing and specified to zero, it's summertime, and what's specified with it, it's standard time, and it does the proper shifting for the time zone to basically flag your local time as this is the first time through or the second time through. This took a lot of discussion and required creating a new um, SIG mailing list to just figure out this one PEP. It was that complicated. Uh, PEP 498. Now, when I bring this up, some people cheer with elation that we've added this. And then if you're on Hacker News, you complain that we now have a third way of doing string formatting. Uh, hopefully, everyone in this room is going to fall on the former camp and be elated. Uh, if you're not so happy, well, sorry. Um, Basically, we added a concept of what we call format strings, or F strings. If you notice in the example, it might not be totally obvious, uh, there's an F prefix, much like R for raw strings or U for Unicode strings. And basically what that symbolizes is to Python is this string is going to have the same syntax as str.format, but it's automatically going to actually tease out all the formatters and all the parts of the string that need to be interpolated and actually pull out the names from the scope of where that F string is being executed. So what's actually happening under the hood here, actually, basically, is Python is teasing out that string literal, figuring out where all those curly braces are, calling format appropriately, and then basically doing a stir join in the end underneath it all. So while this is all kind of obviously a lot cleaner to read than stir format, it actually is also faster than stir format because we're able to do preprocessing ahead of time and emit the proper bytecode to actually do what you need. So this is actually faster than stir format. It's easier to use in stir format. It's basically just better. Now, obviously, stir format still has its uses if you have to pass around the method for whatever reason. Uh, but people, when they start using this, tend to be very, 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 very happy. All right, uh, pep 506 and 524. Uh, <laughs> if you read Python dev, you may have noticed there was quite the thread for about a month on this topic, uh, including pulling in Linux kernel developers. So it was an interesting discussion that month. Uh, basically, what ended up happening was we discovered that in Python 3.5.2, uh, in the 524 section, um, we discovered os.u uh, random, which is the best way to get um, cryptographic secure random uh, bits uh, blocked if there was not enough randomness in the operating system. Now, normally, this isn't a problem if you're just using your desktop or whatever. But if you're using a container that starts up instantaneously or using a little IoT device that doesn't have a lot of input, uh, that could be a problem. Because what would happen is, is basically your system would halt to a crawl until enough input that randomly was coming into the system initialized the entropy for the Linux kernel to actually give you this cryptographically secure bits. Uh, so what ended up happening was, is we realized that's not great. And on top of that, random isn't really meant for cryptographically secure anything. And people have been kind of abusing it for that and basically getting it wrong. So what happened was is uh, PEP 506 defined the secrets module, which is what you should always use if you need anything that's cryptographically secure or in any way related to security. Uh, the random module is there and useful if you need to do like modeling or simulation. Like, I need some random numbers, but I need them to be repeatable for tests. 
Um, basically, use the secrets module if you have no specific reason to be using random, is the way to go. Because if you come back later and realize, oh, shoot, I screwed up. I really should have been doing something cryptographically secure. Uh, it's going to be hard to change your code that's already out there. And in terms of os.urandom, what we did was uh, we left it as is uh, to block, but we added an os.getRandom that will actually raise an exception if it was going to block. So you can make a decision of what do I want to do? Do I want to somehow get more entropy and wait? Do I want to use a less secure system or what have you? Basically, we just added more flexibility to the system to get you what you need. Uh, PEP 509. Um, 99.999% of you, and I think that's still being very liberal with that number, will not care about this. I think there are about two people in this room, I'm one of them, that actually care about this. But I'm trying to be thorough, so I'm going to go through this real quick. But basically, and the second person's right there. Um, basically what happened was dictionaries gained an internal version ID. So anytime a dictionary is mutated, at the C level, there's actually an ID number you can grab to see uh, basically what current version of the dictionary is at. Um, this is useful for people who need to do some performance optimizations because namespaces in Python are old dictionaries. So when we have that kind of information, what we can do is go, oh, look, the global namespace hasn't changed since the last time I looked. I can use a cache copy of something I pulled out of the global namespace or the built-in namespace and actually get um, performance improvements. So JITS will use this. Uh, Python itself will eventually use this, I believe. Right, Yuri? <laughs> yes, Yuri says yes. OK. Uh, so. You don't need to care, but eventually those will make Python faster. So, yay. Um, PEP 515. Um, this is a really one of these little small tweaks that you see happen in Python on occasion that are really nice, and you just kind of didn't realize how much you really wished you had it. Um, basically, you can now use underscores in numeric literals. So this allows you to really easily format your numeric literals to make them really easy to read. Um, I don't know about you, but basically any time I put more than six zeros in a row, I have to start counting the zeros to make sure I get it right. With this, I don't have to, because I can put an underscore between every uh, triple of zeros and actually very easily tell that that's uh, a, bill uh, a million versus a billion or something else. And that is actually uh, a billion, so that's a typo. Because uh, I said, <laughs> because I had added a million originally, and I realized that doesn't make it too obvious, and I forgot to change the name of my variable. Uh, yeah, it shows you no matter how many times you read your slides, there's always going to be something. Um, and as you can see, when you do hex numbers, for instance, 32-bit colors, it makes it a lot easier to read because you can really tell the separation of everything. Uh, PEP 519, uh, adding a file system path protocol. This was one of my PEPs. Um, <laughs> Stephen Turnbull is very happy. He was very involved in that discussion. Uh, another long one. Uh, basically, what happened was is someone asked, uh, why can't I use pathlib. I can't use the pathlib module everywhere. And basically, that led to a question of why doesn't pathlib um, subclass stir? And I'm not going to get into it right now. You can ask Q&A if you really care. But basically, what we realized is we needed to define an interface for, defi for objects that represent a path on the file system. And so we defined dunder fs path, which returns a string or bytes representation of that path. And then we went through the standard library, especially in the OS. Uh, an OS.path module and everywhere else in the standard library. And basically, we went, OK, uh, let's let that support Dunder FS path. And by doing that and adding that interface to uh, pathlib, the standard library now supports pathlib throughout the entire uh, standard library. So you can now use pathlib anywhere. You can use it with open, OSPath.exists if you really wanted to. Uh, the key idea, though, is by adding this into the standard library, if you're running Python 3.6, uh, even uh, third-party code you might find out there out there that's not updated to use this directly will just kind of fall through and support pathlib because if they're just using os.path to do stuff it's just going to work so basically this should allow you to use pathlib all over the place uh, pep 520 preserving class attribute definition order this is the one other place in this talk where I'm going to mention that there's a mapping that keeps its ordering and don't rely on it in any other place than the two and that's the end of my warnings on that uh, basically, what this lets you do is the order of definition of things in your class are preserved. So you can actually define the attributes and the methods and everything. And actually, the mapping for the uh, dunderdict, the namespace basically of the class, will actually preserve the order of that definition. So you could see things like enum becoming even more magical, where you just define your things in order, and it automatically knows to number them 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, for instance. 
Uh, PEP 523, adding a frame evaluation API to CPython. Uh, once again, this is one of my PEPs. Um, so you can ask me technical details on this if you want. Uh, once again, 99.9999% of you aren't going to care. Uh, but if you're writing a JIT, a debugger, or profiler, you're going to find this useful. Uh, basically, there's a C API now for CPython that will actually let you specify the function to handle frame evaluation. Uh, this is important for JITs because this is how JITs go, OK, I'm not going to run the bytecode. I'm going to go run the JITted code. Or for profilers and debuggers, it's really easy to hook in now and tell when you start executing a function. And it basically makes ev uh, pi eval eval frame ex pluggable. Uh, this will probably actually be used in the next release of Python tools of Visual Studio, for instance, to make it uh, easier to hook in and uh, do debugging, track, uh, debugging work. Uh, PEP 525 and 530. Uh, this is Yuri's work, who's sitting here up front. Um, basically, if you've been using Python 3.5, you've probably discovered async and await and gone, this is fantastic. But I can't use async and await everywhere. That's frustrating. Yuri got rid of the frustration. Uh, basically, you can now use async and await keywords um, as necessary in uh, generators, which then, because of the way Python defines comprehensions for sets, dictionaries, and lists, falls through to those as well. So basically, you can now define an asynchronous generator to use with async4. And that also means then you can use that in list comprehensions as well. So basically, there shouldn't be any more real surprises about where you can use async and await in terms of the syntax for Python as long as it's within an async function. Thank you, Yuri. Um, Python 526, syntax for variable annotations. Uh, this is type hinting. I know some of you don't love this. Some of you probably do love it. Depends if you're basically working at a huge enterprise company that just loves types and doing this anyway with knock strings. But basically, uh, when Guido added um, type hints, um, they only really worked on functions, right? Because they were part of type annotations on the function definition or the method definition. That doesn't cover the other cases of where, for instance, you need to specify what types are on a class for attributes. Uh, whether they're instance or class. This doesn't cover local variables where something might not be typed, but you want to type it yourself in your code. So what this does is basically adds the ability to add type hints to all those cases. So if you'll see in this example, uh, anything module level can now be typed. Um, you can add type hints for anything in the class, whether it's an instance variable, uh, instance variable with a default, basically by providing a value on the class, uh, but being not, um, shadowed when you def add it on the instance. And there's a new um, uh, type in the typing module called class var to represent uh, class values that are always going to be only on the class. Excuse me. And both those cases of at the uh, module level and within the class itself body, those will get added to a Dunder annotations dictionary, which will uh, have the key of the uh, thing that has the type hints and then what the type hint is itself. And then for the local variables, uh, you can type those. But those actually just get tossed for performance reasons. So they're in the AST, but basically during runtime, you won't see them because you just don't really need them. And exposing those would just not be worth it. But basically, this should cover all the cases necessary so that you can do type hints versus in your Python 2 code to make it easier to go to Python 3 because you can then run your code through MyPy, make sure it type checks properly, then run it through Python 3, see so then also type checks properly there, and you have a better idea that your types aren't going to completely collapse on, your, on you as you um, go from 2 to 3, for instance. Uh, but 528, 529. If you're a Windows user, this will probably make you happy. Uh, the REPL now uses UTF-8. Uh, if you're a Windows user and ever try to print out some Unicode that does not fit within the default encoding of the uh, REPL, you will know the frustration. <laughs> uh, this solves it now. Uh, the other thing is, is uh, Windows now supports bytes, uh, binary encoded paths, file paths. Uh, I believe back in 3.2, they were removed, and you had to always use Unicode strings. The problem is, is there's enough code out there that assumes Linux and wants to stay with binary-based file paths that Steve Dower basically said, OK, you know what we'll do is we'll allow binary paths, but they have to be encoded in UTF-8, and we'll just re-encode as necessary for the Windows APIs. But what this means is, for instance, um, Twisted is a lot happier about this. And they're actually, I, the tweet from uh, Amber, who's the release manager and doing a lot of the Python 3 work, they might actually make Twisted be 3.6 and newer, because this makes their life so much easier, because they're already bytes compatible across the board. OK, now. Uh, 
Uh, that'll come later. Um, so there's a couple things on the pep. Ah, oh, damn. All right. Um, so one thing is there's a new environment variable called um, Python malloc. Um, and what this does is allows you to find an environment variable to basically control how memory is allocated. So for instance, let's say you didn't compile your um, Python uh, with dash dash with dash pi debug. With this flag, you can still get the extra checks that you would normally have gotten for memory allocation, at least, uh, without having to do a recompile. You just literally just set the flag to debug, and suddenly you'll start get warnings that stuff wasn't free, and you're reusing memory that was cleared earlier. So it's really handy if you need to debug something in production and you don't want to launch off a Python de uh, pi debug version of your interpreter. Uh, there's also a way to force using malloc instead of Python's arena-based uh, allocator, which is really helpful for things like Valgrind that really don't like it when you use something other than malloc. Uh, so this can also help there. Uh, and lastly, um, one of the things that came out of the sprints is support for dtrace and system tap. Um, yes, I see Jess really happy. Basically, people who have used dtrace are really excited about this, and it just shows that a lot of us don't know anything about dtrace because more people aren't as excited about this. Um, basically, you have to compile this in as a flag. Uh, there's basically no real performance in because that's how dtrace and system help are defined. But basically, what this will allow you to do is use those systems to actually um, trace function calls and returns uh, when GC started and finished, and what line of code has been executed. And uh, basically, you can do this in live code, turn it on and off, add a bunch of filters. It's basically a really easy way to control uh, tracing of uh, execution. and as I said, people who have used dtrace and system tap are really excited over this. So maybe we all just need to learn some dtrace and system tap to all be excited too. OK, uh, we're about to get to the end. Uh, but I figured I have to show numbers, because everyone likes numbers and pretty pictures. Um, now, if you want, you can always look at numbers at speed.python.org. Uh, those are run every so often by Victor Stinner, who's done a lot of work and deserves a lot of Thanks for trying to improve the benchmark runner for Python itself and uh, updating the benchmark suite. Uh, but you can always go there to see how things are working on ter terms of performance, at least on the benchmark machine we use for that. Uh, but without further ado, on my uh, MacBook Pro at home, uh, basically, if you run this rigorously on the apps benchmarks, of which there are four that run on two and three, um, basically, everything looks faster. Um, basically, I, everything is set here for 2.7 as the baseline, because that's what everyone always asks, is Python 3 faster than 2? Uh, as you'll see, for 2 to 3, uh, 3.5 was already, already faster, and now 3.6 is even faster than that. Um, you might not be able to read the lines, but basically it went from taking 90% of the amount of time that 2.7 takes to execute that benchmark to 3.6 taking 80% of the time. So there's a, a big performance jump there. Uh, Chameleon is flat and it's slightly uh, slower. Uh, HTML5 lib, once again, 3.5 is actually a decent amount faster, and then 3.6 is even faster than that. And then the same for Tornado. So basically, if someone asks, is Python 3 faster than 2, you can go, yes, it, it can be for certain workloads. In general, you can, if you really want to be conservative, just say it's flat. But honestly, benchmark your own code. But basically, the argument that 2.7 is always faster is gone, 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 gone. No more, worrying, no, more, no more using that argument when, as the 2020 apocalypse approaches, and 2.7 now costs you money for support. And with that, I will take your questions. We have 10 minutes for questions, so please put up your hands, and I will do my best to get the mic to you promptly. And if there are no questions about what I covered, I can also talk about general Python development or what have you. Oh, question over there. Can you go back to the type annotations? Sure. Uh, back, back, back. The yeah, the the ints with default. Yep. So, because um, so you said that's now an instance variable. No, so th this doesn't change any semantics at all, okay. right? So if you did this in Python right now, basically what happens is, is a value is, is put on the class, so it's like a method. Yeah. But if you were to assign it on an instance, the way Python um, looks up uh, data descriptors uh, and 
various other descriptors and such, it would look on the instance first, see that value, and then return that instead of falling back to the class. So this doesn't change semantics at all. It's just the point that it doesn't change semantics. And it, basically, how do you, what does this represent when you add a type? Does it represent the value as a class value, or is it an instance value? And we're basically saying it's treated as if it's on the instance. And, and what you just said, there's more for documentation than semantics. Yeah, so type hints, in case people have not heard this, bashed in their skulls enough times, do not influence performance in any way, shape, or form. Basically, view them as, as documentation, period, and basically executable documentation that tool, offline static tooling can actually use to enforce the fact that you documented it right and make sure that you're actually following your own documentation. Can, can you then also explain class var a little more? Well, so that's the case where basically you are directly mutating the class value. So like, let's say you had a class that kept a count of the number of instances that's been created. That's what that's for. So basically, you're directly mutating the, ins the attribute off the class itself and not off through an instance. Strictly documentation. There's literally no runtime difference other than the Stunder annotations exists. And that's it. Any other questions? Invalid backslash in bytes? I'm trying to remember that when there's 16 peps. It's hard to keep it all straight. Oh, I don't remember it off the top of my head. I'm too jet lagged. Sorry, I flew in from Vancouver and t some drunk people next door last night decided to come home at 3 in the morning and it kept me up for two hours. So I'm kind of running out of fumes a little. Any other questions that hopefully I will be able to answer? Make it the poor man run, Jeff. Uh, with the D-Trace support, does that mean that the kind of patch sets that have been out floating around, I think Serhi uh, has been maintaining one for a while yep. inside inside one yep. of the bugs. Does that mean those can those can go away and they don't have to be maintained anymore? Yep. Yes. Yep. Thank uh, you. Wukash Lang I did all this work at the Sprint, actually. That was what he worked on for the week while he was hosting us uh, in September. And basically, yeah, he went through, looked at all of them, and said, like, all right, I can't follow this, or I can, it's great. And he just pulled in what he could, and basically that's it, and it's in. And if there's more functionality to add, which is totally possible, basically he just went with what he could do that week and make sure it worked and got it in, and he's totally open to add more. But yeah, basically all those patches that have been flowing around the internet and on the Pythons issue tracker and stuff to add D-Trace support are basically now taken care of. Any other questions? Going once, going twice. Oh, all right, well, thank you. <laughs>